Hi guys, welcome back to our study over chapter 13, the North and the South in the early 1800s. Uh, last time in our uh, lecture we talked about the South and slavery. This time we're going to be talking about the North and uh, the Industrial Revolution that takes place in the early 1800s there. Uh, so for this lecture you'll obviously need your North and South note packet. Today we're going to be covering pages 10 and 11. So make sure you have those ready. All right, before we get going on the North, I want to uh, take a step back and look at the South. Uh, why does the South not have the Industrial Revolution where the North does? What, what's the deal going on there? Um, if you remember from our last lecture, one of the impacts or effects of the cotton gin was that there was little to no industry in the South. And then we examined reasons uh, why that was. Because in the South, uh, cotton is already so profitable that um, why, why take the time and the effort and the risk to uh, create these factories when you already know cotton's making you a lot of money? So it's like one of those things, if it's not broken, let's not try to fix it. Secondly, there is little capital uh, to be had to start uh, building factories and creating goods because most of the money uh, from these plantation owners are already going to be wrapped up in the land, in the crops, and into uh, the slaves. And thirdly, uh, in, unless you were a plantation owner, you were, uh, well, number one, either a slave, number two, you were a small, poor, white farmer in the South, so you did not have the means to buy these goods, uh, man manufacture goods anyway. So that is the reason why there's little to no industry in the South. But in the North, however, it's going to be a different story. The North obviously does not have the soil and the climate in order to have this robust agricultural economy. So the North is going to have to rely on something else. So where is this industrial revolution born out of? We have to take a look at Samuel Slater. Slater was a, an Englishman who had worked in the textile business in England, uh, built machines and, and set up factories in England. Well, he is going to move from England to America and in a sense giving us the beginnings of our revolution. England was uh, probably about 30 to 40 years ahead of us as far as industrializing our country. And Slater is going to bring over the blueprints secretively by memorizing these blueprints to build these machines um, because it was illegal for anyone to leave England and go elsewhere to uh, uh, you know build these machines. So uh, Slater finds a uh, place along the river in Pawtucket, Rhode Island to build his uh, Slater textile mill. And um, you're going to find this a lot here is that these textile mills are going to be uh, on these rivers and we'll get to that here in a little bit. Again, like I said, uh, it was illegal for anyone to leave the country with knowledge or blueprints for these machines because England wanted to keep the competitive edge of having the knowledge of mass producing goods over any other country. Uh, because as we can, as we know, the most industrialized country is probably going to be the most powerful in the world. So they didn't want that knowledge to get outside of their country. So what, let's define the Industrial Revolution. It is a revolution or a sudden uh, huge change in industry or how we do things. We go from uh, factory machines replacing hand tools and then we go to large-scale manufacturing so we're going to replace farming as the main form of work. I created a list of the impact that the Industrial Revolution is going to have. It absolutely changes or revolutionizes how we do things in this time period. Uh, we, we go from being rural communities to now more urban communities. We go from an agricultural economy to, to more of an industrial or industrial economy. The way we travel changes. We go from uh, horse-drawn buggies to steam power trains and we go from making goods by our hands to now tending to machines as they make our goods for us. So this is a revolution when you think about how much uh, has changed just because of machines. 
So let's talk about the factory system. And uh, one person that I definitely want you to know uh, is Francis Lowell. Francis Lowell is going to um, start the factory system in Massachusetts. There's a place in Massachusetts called Lowell, Massachusetts. It's going to come from this guy and his factories. And mostly in his factories, he's going to employ uh, young women, and they were called the Lowell girls. So we're going to look at the phases of industrialization. I'll give you a brief overlook and then give you one of my whiteboard specials. So number one, uh, we're going to take jobs and we're going to divide them up. Each person is going to have a, a special skill set to work on one certain job. And then, you're, and then what Lowell did is he took all these specialized workers and put them in one location. And thirdly, um, after they became specialized, now comes the invention of machines to help these people do their jobs. So to put it in a diagram, the phases of indu industrialization, you have uh, persons A, B, and C all have different skill sets, but they're at different locations. And this is going to waste time and, and money uh, transporting goods. So we take all these people and we put them under one roof in a factory. So now persons A, B, and C are uh, working together, doing their own skill set. And then with the invention of machines, of the knowledge that Slater brought over, you now have persons A, B, and C now tending to machines under one roof, uh, each doing their own job. So you have the factory system. So this is going to make things more profitable and efficient and uh, leads to major economic develop, development in the North. Here's just a picture of some people working in a, in a factory or a textile mill. So industry is uh, industry of the North is going to allow uh, the North to really produce two thirds of all goods in the U.S. And so this is going to lead to a dependency between the North and the South. And just to show you a little uh, diagram again, is you see in the North with the factories and the textile mills. Let's say the North are uh, creating shirts, but in the South they're growing cotton. Well, in order to make the shirt, you need the cotton. And Southerners needing the clothes would have to um, basically buy it from the profits from their cotton. So we have this kind of interdependence here between the North and the South. Uh, they both needed each other. And this kind of relationship is going to continue on through the Civil War. And ironically enough, the North and the South, even at the height of the Civil War, were each other's number one trading partner. And I just find that uh, kind of amazing that um, they were at war but yet needed each other so much. Uh, here is just a pamphlet of, um, you know, your, the hours that the Lowell Mill girls would have to follow when they got their break, what their schedule was in certain months of the year. Uh, they would get a few months off of the year uh, during the summer times when it was extremely hot, but uh, this kind of all lays out the expectations, when you can leave, when you can have lunch, and, and all that. So uh, many of the first factories are going to be in the New England area for uh, two reasons. Number one, New England's going to have a lot of uh, fast-moving rivers to supply energy uh, and water to these factories. And we call this hydropower. So water is flowing uh, in the rivers, and in the rivers, the factory is going to put a, a river wheel in there, and the, the running water is going to churn this wheel, which in turn is connected to a belt, which is in turn connected to another wheel in the factory, and the whole process goes on and on. So this provides hydropower. And secondly, there was a large supply of people who were willing to work in the factories. During this time, the early 1800s, there's a major immigration explosion uh, in, the, in the north, especially with uh, the Irish and the Germans, among others. And so they were looking for new opportunities and, and a way to support their family. So uh, not having the money to purchase land, uh, they're going to look to the cities and the factories to uh, make their way of life here. 
Um, now, as I said before, in the early stages of uh, the industrialization of the North, um, power is going to be brought to us by hydropower or power by water. But by 1830, with uh, the technology increasing in steam power, now these factories don't have to be settled right on the river. Rather, they can be really built anywhere uh, since we now know how to harness the power of steam. Another thing that um, is going to make uh, the industrialization of a country um, helpful is having interchangeable parts. Um, interchangeable parts is making an item out of parts that are identical and can be mass produced. This is going to be introduced by Eli Whitney, if you remember, the creator of the American style of the cotton gin. So what this allows us to do is uh, it can speed up production. Uh, items can be mass produced because you can use the same item in say two, three, or four different models of goods. And secondly, repairs are going to be much easier to do on these items because you can just take this bad part out and replace it with a part that is interchangeable and that has already been mass produced. And thirdly, um, this is going to allow the use of unskilled, which means cheaper labor and lower salary workers because you don't have to have someone who has great knowledge of how to fix parts when they go broke. You just take the part out, throw it away, grab a new part and put it in. Um, so we learned about the cruelties of slavery and um, the, the forced labor uh, there. Now. Life in the North, especially for the factory workers, is, is not going to be all that glamorous, though uh, they are going to earn wages, but some people said that they were uh, wage slaves. Uh, but they were at least making money for their labor versus the slaves making nothing at all. But um, just some conditions of uh, the workers in the factory, they would have to work uh, a, on average 11 and a half hours a day. Maybe some of your parents are already working those kind of hours. Uh, back then there were no labor laws, so uh, there were no laws dictating how many hours a week you could work, uh, how much time you get for a lunch break, do you get vacation time, uh, things that we now take for granted. Uh, teens would work in these, in these mills and um, these were very dangerous because they had no laws that would dictate like putting guards on spinning um, parts of a machine like we see today. Even you know, going to the factory, everyone's wearing safety goggles. They didn't have that, those kind of laws. So teens would work and they would work up to 10 hours a day. Um, again, very dangerous atmosphere with all these moving parts. And when a machine would go down, they would even have kids as young as eight years old climb inside the machine to uh, fix the problem in the machine. So because there were no guards on these moving parts, as you can see, there are pulleys, wheels, and, and belts moving all around in the factory. Uh, if you weren't careful and you accidentally got your hand in one of those belts, it, you could very easily have a limb ripped right off your body. So it's, it was a pretty dangerous atmosphere. So what was, like, uh, what was life like for other people in the North? First, we'll talk about uh, the ladies. And uh, girls, this is not going to make you happy at all. But um, obviously women were not um, respected as the same rate of citizen as men. As a matter of fact, for every dollar that a male makes per hour for the same exact job, a female is only going to work or make, I'm sorry, 40 cents an hour. So that's not even 50%. That's not even half of what a man makes for the same jo exact job for the same exact hour. Now, immigrants, as I mentioned before, there's a huge immigration wave into the United States and the Irish and the Germans. They too are going to be treated as second-rate citizens, often blamed for unemployment and crime. And uh, you know, Irish and the Germans are going to bring this culture of drinking, uh, so that's going to lead to the stigma of, of these two groups of immigrants. And also uh, African Americans. Um, if you could, if you could make a hierarchy here, you can see uh, at the top would probably be the 
well, not probably, will be the white males, and then it would be women, and then below them, immigrants, and then at the very bottom of the uh, class system, if you will, in the North was uh, African Americans. Um, though they were free, African Americans were still discriminated against and did not even make as much as the immigrants and not as much as the women and definitely not as much as uh, white males. Um, so this um, industrialization of our, uh, the way we do things, the way we make things is going to lead to technological advances in the way we travel too. So transportation is going to change. Robert Fulton, you'll want to know this name right here, he is credited for creating the first steamboat, harnessing the power of steam uh, in order to, to make a, a, a boat go down river, or now we can actually go against the current of the river. So this is definitely going to speed up transportation. Instead of just relying on the current of the river to take your boat, you can also uh, have power um, in, in your, your boat to go down the river. Uh, the first steamboat was the Claremont. Right here's its picture. And from the steamboat, we then moved to uh, Cooper's steam locomotive, uh, again, Peter Cooper. So this is now going to make land travel faster and more affordable from the 1830s uh, and on forward. And because the North uh, has the factories to make the tracks and the goods and the trains for uh, this, um, the railroad system. The North is obviously going to have more advantages when it comes to having uh, railroads. As a matter of fact, I uh, showed you this diagram in the last lecture. All, of all U.S. railroads, two-thirds was owned in the North or was in the North and only a third in the South. So not only does transportation speed up, but the way we communicate speeds up. Um, today we are spoiled with, uh, you know, um, text messaging and chatting, Facebooking, Twitter, whatever, and uh, we this is just we have this instant communication. Well, the the instant communication was unheard of before 1844. Samuel Morse's uh, version of the telegraph. He was going to revolutionize the way we communicate. Up to this point, it was by snail mail. Now, uh, with the system of electrical pulses and dots and dashes, we can now communicate instantly uh, from city to city. So um, many of you probably uh, have heard of the Morse code. Well, this comes from Samuel Morse and his telegraph system. Uh, here's a picture of the original telegraph machine in 1837 in one of its early stages. And uh, I kind of like this, um, this drawing done here because it kind of wraps up the progress that took place in the Industrial Revolution. Um, here you have steam trains, steam boats, you have the telegraph, you have the factory system here. So the years of 1800 on up to the Civil War was just an amazing um, half century of progress and, and economic activity. Uh, but this is all going to come to a head um, between the North and the South, as we will find out later. All right, so that's it. And uh, do me a favor, so when I'm checking your homework, on page 11, could you please put a star around the number 11 at the bottom of the right-hand page? Uh, that way I know you got this little message, and uh, then I can check your homework. So we'll, we'll see you later, and uh, have a good night.